Good evening, everyone. It is good to be gathered with you tonight for worship at Experience at First Christian Church in Macomb, Illinois. We are so glad to be together on this weekend, which is Independence Day weekend, 4th of July weekend. I'm sure there will be gatherings with families and friends. But today, we're here, and we will be presented with God's love if we are just open to that. May we find God's love beyond limits as we come into this worship service tonight, into this experience of worship tonight. A couple of announcements as we get going. Um, if you are wanting to give to the ministries of First Christian Church, there are a couple of different ways. In person, we have an offering tray at the welcome table. Online or in person, we have our Givelify app, which can be found at our website, www.fccmacomb.org. And we give thanks for your generosity to the ministries. Tonight, we uplift our emergency cupboard ministry, a ministry where there's food on the outside of our building, a ministry that is used every day, a ministry that is vital to those who are um, needing food. And so if you are able to bring food tonight, you could leave that in the elevator lobby. If you um, want to make a donation, again, drop that marked into the offering tray or use the Givelify app. We give thanks again for your generous giving to the emergency cupboard, and we give thanks for the great work that it does on behalf of our church. This evening, we want to say thanks to those who have been veterans serving our military, providing for our freedoms. We have plaques here at the communion table. Maybe you want to take a look at those later tonight when wandering or during the discussion time here in just a few minutes or whatever. Um, these are the folks who have served. If there's anyone in the sanctuary this night, but I feel like I know everyone and I don't think anyone has served. Has anyone here served? Has anyone here been the spouse of someone who served? To you spouses, we give thanks for your commitment, should have said that this morning too, by the way, I apologize for that. We give thanks for your commitment to um, your spouses and to our country. Our steps are almost done. We're very excited about that. Um, Collins Concrete's been doing a great job. Tuesday they come to make the last pour. And so I think that Tuesday is it. They will be done. They may have to come back Wednesday to cure them. But i um, very excited that that project has come to an end and um, grateful for the great work that has been done. As we come tonight, we are looking at chapter 10 in the Gospel of Luke. And it is a place where 70 people have been sent out in pairs. We'll read that here in just a moment. Where 70 people are sent out in pairs to do ministry on behalf of Jesus. And so I think that that's kind of an adventure. You'll see why it's an adventure when we read the scripture a little bit tonight. But for our opening question, for our community building moment, this is what I invite you to share in groups of like threes and fours. What has been your favorite adventure? What has been your favorite adventure? So in groups of fours, let's stand up, share our community, build our community, and answer this question.
shepherd of the sea, author of the questions that are hidden in me. A voice out on the water, a whisper in the tree. Like a river you will flow, like a river you will flow. I see you in the sun. Feel you in the breeze. I hear you in the silence and the mystery. So open up my heart. I'm longing to believe. Teach me. Like a river you will flow, like a river you Let's pray. We come into this beautiful sanctuary tonight, God, mindful that you are present, grateful that we have the freedom to be gathered in this space, thankful that in faith you provide us freedom to choose, to choose to live for you or to choose to live for ourselves. It's a hard choice sometimes, God. Living in this great country, it can be difficult. We've been taught so many things, but hopefully we will cling to the teachings of our faith, that we will learn how to be more selfless and give up the ways of selfishness, that we will seek to offer peace and not provide chaos. We pray tonight, God, that we will open our hearts to you that you will enter into this space, into our souls powerfully, that you will become real to us in such a wonderful way, that we will feel comfort, that we can find the peace we seek to offer. So come near to us, God, in the beauty of the space, in music, in word, in quiet time of reflection. Make yourself known to your people. We are desperate to seek you tonight. We offer our hearts, we offer our prayers. In the name of the Christ, amen. Lord of the heart. 
harvest and we worship you we worship you this day you're the lord of the harvest and we worship you we worship you this day So as I said before, our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Let us read and hear the word. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. One of my favorite preachers, Tony Campolo, tells a story of a friend of his that he met when they were both working on their doctorate, PhDs. They were both to become teachers, professors at colleges. Tony in sociology, his friend in English literature. Friends, what do you do with a degree in English literature except (laughs) teach at a college, right? Well, this professor was three weeks into his first semester of teaching, and he walked right into the dean's office and said, I can't do this. I'm going to quit. And the dean said, I'm sorry? You can't quit three weeks into a semester. And the man said, watch me. The man's mother was very upset very nervous on what her son might do with his life. I mean, again, he was a PhD in English literature. She said, Tony, there's nowhere he can go with that. Could you go visit him and talk with him? I think what she really meant was talk some sense into him. So Tony made the drive from Philadelphia, where he was teaching at Eastern College, over to New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey, in fact. He knocked on his friend's door, 
And his friend said, come in, man. Come in. It's so good to see you. Tony walked into this apartment that was an attic apartment. One room. But Tony was kind of jealous because he looked and there were all these cool posters on the wall and these books upon books and beanbag chairs. His friend said, come in and have a seat. Tony sat in a beanbag chair. He wasn't really comfortable with it. His friend said, I couldn't handle it, Tony. I quit. And Tony said, I know that you quit. What are you doing? doing with yourself? How are you feeding yourself? And he was like, Tony, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't teach the students. Every time I walked into that classroom to give a lecture, a little of me died. So now I'm a mailman. And Tony was like, a PhD mailman. The friend replied, there aren't a lot of us. They continued to talk a little bit. Tony got to the point where he knew he was not going to convince his friend to go back to teaching. And so he finally just said to his friend, you know what? If you're going to be a mailman, be the best mailman you can be. And his friend said, I'm an awful mailman. And Tony said, why do you say you're an awful mailman? He said, because everybody else who delivers the mail, they get back to the post office by about 1.30. I don't get back until 5.30 or 6. And Tony said, why are you so slow? The man said, because I visit. I don't just deliver the mail. I talk to people. And when you talk to people, it takes a long time. The man went on to explain that if someone wants to talk with him, he just sits down and he has a cup of coffee and he talks with them. He said to Tony, you know how many people along my route were never visited until I became their mailman? It's really hard, though, because I can't sleep at night. Tony's like, why can't you sleep at night? He's like, have you ever tried to sleep after drinking 20 cups of coffee? Tony said that when this man, this PhD mailman, when it's his birthday, all the people on his route, they get together. They rent the high school gym down the street, and they throw a party for their mailman who visits them. Tony says that they love him because he's a mailman who expresses the love of Jesus everywhere he goes, changing his world, changing the lives of people. That man who is delivering the mail like Jesus would deliver the mail is an agent of God. In delivering a keynote to a group of youth using this story, Tony says this, I want you, he's talking to the youth, but I'm talking to you. I want you to become a revolutionary for Jesus. When I ask you to be a revolutionary, I don't mean that I want you to do something violent. I'm asking you to seriously consider doing something for Jesus among people who have real needs. How does that sound? becoming a revolutionary for Jesus, meeting people, visiting people, taking care of people who have real needs. That would be an adventure, wouldn't it? Usually when we think of Jesus sending people out in pairs, we think of the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples are sent out in pairs and given kind of the same instructions that Jesus gave tonight. Or earlier in Luke chapter 9, the same thing. The disciples are given instructions to go out in pairs, and they're given basically the same instructions as we read in our scripture tonight. Those instructions to go 
to places to not carry a purse or a bag or sandals. Here, I think there's something interesting. And greet no one on the road. I wonder if Jesus is trying to protect his disciples because the roads were dangerous. There were robbers and thieves. And so I think that Jesus might be trying to protect them. But as the story goes on, Jesus tells his disciples to enter into a house. And when entering that house, to say peace upon this house. And Jesus says, if your peace is shared, then the peace will rest on that person. But if not, that peace will be returned to you. I've never thought of peace coming back to me if someone just didn't want to receive what I was offering. I'm not sure that it really still works that way, but that's what Jesus said. Jesus is telling his disciples, offer peace, and hopefully they'll receive it. And if they don't, well, take that peace back and and move on. He says that if you um, are in that house and you are welcomed, then eat and drink whatever is provided the scholar that I read doesn't talk about this, and it just kind of hit me. So I'm just going off on a tangent here. Jesus says, eat whatever is provided. Are the disciples only going to Jewish households? Because if the disciples are only going to Jewish households, then, of course, the food laws wouldn't matter. But if they're going into Gentile homes, the food laws would matter. And Jesus is saying, eat whatever is provided. That's an interesting aside for me that I hadn't thought of until just this moment. I don't know. Jesus says to these 70 disciples who will go out in pairs, so 35 pairs of disciples, enter a town, eat and drink what is provided. If welcome, cure the sick, telling them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Heal the people and give them the message that the kingdom of God has come near. If you enter a town, but you aren't welcomed, Jesus says, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Can you imagine just going into your neighborhood, talking about Jesus, talking about faith, talking about God, and if people don't like it, then you have to go into their front yard and take your shoes off and say, hey. I'm protesting that you aren't listening to my message. But Jesus says to still tell them this. Know that the kingdom of God has come near. So Jesus is telling his disciples, tell them, tell all the people that you meet that the kingdom of God has come near, whether they welcome the disciples or not. Jesus says it would be really good if the people welcome. Jesus says that it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town that doesn't welcome the disciples. Now, these disciples, they're going as kind of like John the Baptist. They're going out as ambassadors. They're going out as preparers of the way. Jesus is making his way from town to town to town. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but from the beginning of Gospel 9 until the or Luke 9 to 18, Jesus is working his way to Jerusalem. And so these ambassadors, these disciples, these 35 pairs, or 36, depending on which gospel, uh, which um, interpretation of this gospel that you read, these 35 pairs of people are going out to prepare the way for Jesus to come into these towns, to preach, to teach, to heal to be a part of the community, to spread the message that God is near, the Messiah is coming, that grace and love and forgiveness are yours. But they can't take anything with them, and they have to depend on the kindness of the people that they meet along the way. In verse 16, Jesus says, Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me, and rejects the one who sent me. What do you think of this passage? 
if you were one of those 70 people, could you do it? I mean, Ann and I are going on vacation next week, and I can guarantee you there are going to be at least two suitcases, an extra bag for food, and you get it, right? You've been on vacation yourself. Jesus is saying, go in faith. Spread the news. The kingdom of God is near. Share peace. Our Alan Culpepper says this about this passage. He writes, how does the church articulate its mission today? In what ways can the mission of the church be articulated and pursued by the church today? It is not that the mission of the church has become unnecessary or impractical, but simply that the changing conditions of the communities in which we live are forcing us to rethink the gospel's teaching about the mission of those who follow Jesus and to find avenues of obedience that are effective and appropriate for our times as well as faithful to Jesus' teaching. Did we just... Oh, I thought we might have lost the battery. So, church... How can we be effective in spreading the mission? How can we be the best we know how to be in faith? Donald Miller, in his book, Searching for God Knows What, was wondering if what we were doing in the church had more to do with redeeming ourselves to culture than it did with showing Jesus to a hurting world, a world literally filled with outcasts. He was in a record store with a minister friend, and they were having a conversation about that. Is the church doing what the church should be doing? Is it living out its mission? Donald said that he thought that Christians might be obsessed with whether or not we appear cool to the world. And the friend who was in ministry disagreed. He said that, what about all the ministries for the outcasts, the hungry, those who would die lonely? And Donald said, well, that's true, but let's try an experiment. We're sitting here in a record store. There are probably over 10,000 CDs in this store. I want you to find me a CD with an ugly person on it. The friend was like, what? He was like, just play along. So he started going through and looking, and he found one, and he picked it up, and he showed it to Dalman and said, what about this one? It was a picture of a dorky-looking guy holding an acoustic guitar. The print on the CD was like out of the 60s, but the picture was much more modern. Donald said, that was easy enough, wasn't it? The friend said, yeah. Still kind of confused why he was asked to do that. Donald knew that their next stop was this big contemporary Christian bookstore that also had hundreds, if not thousands, of CDs for sale. They entered this Christian bookstore, and Donald said, okay, now let's go to the music section. And the same thing. Find one album with an ugly person. They looked, and they looked, and they looked for more than 20 minutes. They were going through the CDs, and Donald said that there was not one artist in the Christian music store that even slightly passed for ugly. He goes on to say this, and this is his point. Perhaps we are even more obsessed in the church with the stuff that culture is obsessed with. 
we are hardly providing an alternative worldview. Miller is saying that the church is, and not just, not us, or maybe us, but really the church big in general, that we are worried with having the right look, that we are worried with being beautiful to the world, that we are worried about having the right sound, that we are worried about things that we shouldn't be worried about, that we have lost our mission, that we have forgotten what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be courageous adventurers, wandering in our own circles, maybe even getting uncomfortable and getting beyond those circles to share with the world peace, love, hope, faith, joy, to share with the world that you are loved beyond any limit that you can put on yourself, that there is grace in this world, that you don't have to be perfect like those artists in the Christian music store. Katie O'Connell is a mom. And at the time of her brother Roger's death, she had two girls that were 10 and 13. Roger was diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. He did all the right things, went through all the right treatments, trying to prolong his life, but he passed away. Before his death, though, he became obsessed with creativity. And part of that creativity was painting little round rocks with one word, my favorite word, peace. He said that peace rocks. And he wanted to share that message with anyone that he could. So he painted enough rocks that everyone who came to his funeral got one. Katie and her two daughters, their whole family, they were devastated. Roger was a great uncle to her girls. They were grieving deeply, and they didn't know how to do that well. Who does? So they decided to do what Roger had done. They turned to their creativity, and they painted rocks with that single word, peace. They kept painting, they kept painting day after day, day after day, and then all of a sudden they realized that there were so many rocks that it took up half of the dining room table. So they started taking the rocks with them and just leaving them places. They would leave them on fence posts and gas pumps, building ledges and library shelves and public benches wherever it felt right to leave that rock that said simply, peace. Katie was at her mechanic shop. They were at the desk. Her mechanic was working on the computer when she noticed a rock, a familiar peace rock on his desk. And she said to him, cool rock. And he said, it is cool, isn't it? Found it right outside the door. Katie had forgotten that she had left it there months earlier. He went on to say, I walked out there and it was just sitting there waiting for me. I guess you were supposed to find that rock, huh? Yeah. He paused, he looked closely at the rock, and then he said, I guess so. I keep it right there every day. It's my reminder. He got quiet, eventually started working on his computer. Katie sensed that there was more to his 
story, but she could only guess. She'd never know. But she was glad that it meant something to him. She knew how much the painting and the leaving of those rocks had helped to heal her and her daughters. But sitting in that mechanic's garage, she had never once until that moment given a thought to how the people might feel when they received or found one of those rocks. It's one thing to receive this great message of God, but it is another thing, friends, to take that message to the world. God is close by. You are loved. You are forgiven. Grace can be yours. You are not alone in this world. As Jesus sent out those 35 pairs of people, they were given power and authority. As disciples, as faithful disciples, friends, we have more power and authority than we know. May we live in to being missionaries, revolutionaries, whether boldly or quietly. We must live our faith. The world is desperate for us to live our faith. May it be so. falling into and you could join in if you felt it too but that all depends on the love that you
I won't leave this house singing. I won't leave this house singing. I wanna go from here believing in your love. This is right here at this table.
Friends, church, we have a message and we've been called. May we go forth from this place to live into our faith, thereby living into the mission of our church. The mission of First Christian Church is to receive and share God's love. We've been gathered at experience tonight to receive. Let's go forth into the world to share the love of God made known to us in Jesus the Christ. May it be so. May it truly be so. Amen. Believing in your love